Now that we know a little bit about Ohm's law and the driving force for electrical conduction, let's talk about joule heating. Joule heating is a really important thing because it's honestly all around us. Um, so how it works is like this. When you pass current through a material, it heats up. You've observed this if you maybe you saw it at your grandma's house or maybe you have a stove like this. Um, those old coil stoves, right, where you set the pot on something that looks like it's doing this and then that coils back out again, right? So what's going on there is you're passing current through this wire, right? The current enters here, goes through that whole wire, and it exits over here. And what this is designed to do is have a specific resistance value so that you can pass current through here and this whole thing heats up, these electric stoves, right? And these are all around us, okay? You actually saw this earlier in the semester if you watched my iron wire demo, remember? I hooked the power source up to this iron wire, right? We had this piece of wire hanging here. We clipped a positive and a negative wires to this, and then we applied an alternating current. So that caused the electrons to move back and forth through this wire. So what's happening is that as those electrons were jostling back and forth through the wire, they're undergoing collision events. They're crashing into atoms, right? You've got all these atoms that are in your crystal structure. And as you're rushing at electrons through this, back and forth through it, they're going to be colliding with those atoms every once in a while and imparting kinetic energy to that. And so that's going to cause your material to heat up. And this is joule heating. So something that we should know is the equation that tells you how much heat you're going to get for a given current. So it's given right here. Our expression for the heat that we generate as a function of current and resistance in time is as follows. It's going to be proportional to the current squared multiplied by the resistance multiplied by time. That will be how much heat we generate, okay? So uh, imagine this scenario. Uh, when I was doing the iron wire demo, I had to heat it up all the way to 912 degrees Celsius in order to see it switch from ferrite to austenite, and that caused the wire to shrink, right? And that's what we were trying to see. And what's interesting, um, I couldn't wait all day for that to happen. You want it to happen relatively quickly. The first couple times that I tried that experiment, I hooked it up to my wire and I ended up tripping a breaker, right? And so then you lose all your electricity, you have to start over. And I kept on wondering what was going on because I'd seen this done before. Soon I realized what was happening. Um, the wire that I was using was 12 gauge at first. 12 gauge wire, you can use these you know, little charts like that and you can see what 12 gauge corresponds to. 12 gauge is down here. So it corresponds to a, a 0 0.1 inch wire. And that was just too big, so remember, if I have a really big wire, what does that do to my overall resistance? Well, remember, the resistance is equal to resistivity multiplied by length divided by cross-sectional area. So since this experiment was set up, right, from end to end, I had this posted, so I couldn't change L. L was fixed for this experiment. So if I wanted to change my resistance, what I could change was the cross-sectional area of my wire. And so you might say like, well, why does it matter that you change your resistance? Well, remember, Ohm's law tells us that V equals IR, right? And so if R goes up, then I goes down, assuming that you're maintaining a constant 120 volts from your wall or whatever your power source is. So why is that important? Well, your circuit breaker in your home has a fixed value where it doesn't allow more current than some, you know, whatever your fuse dictates. Uh, the fuse I was using was a, I think I had a 30 amp fuse or something. And so my resistance was too small when I used this really big wire with this, right, really large cross-sectional area right here. It was so large that my resistance was small, therefore my current was large, and I was tripping a breaker. So later I realized this, and I realized what I had to do was either increase the length of my wire, I had to make this thing way wider, which I couldn't do, or get smaller wire, right? When I moved to 18 gauge wire, all my problems went away. I was able to cause this thing to heat up because my resistance increased, right here, remember? Right, if I want to increase my joule heating, I can change R, I, or T. By increasing R, I was able to get more heat without overloading my uh, current, and so I didn't trip a breaker. So that's the idea behind joule heating. Let's do a quick example. It says this, how much heat would be generated if you passed 15 amps through a long rectangular sample of copper with dimensions given, basically like a matchstick, and you do so for one minute? You can assume that copper has a constant electrical con resistivity of 16.78 nano ohms per meter. Give your answer in millijoules, round it to the mill nearest millijoule. And then we've got a conversion unit. So this is interesting. Copper, uh, you know from these Ashby charts, copper is one of your very best conductors, right? If you look at electrical resistivity, it's among the lowest. Copper is extremely conductive, right? So this material, because it is very conductive, and we look at our joule heating equation, 
R, our overall resistance, is probably going to be pretty low, so you wouldn't expect it to generate a lot of heat. But let's calculate it. Let's see. Okay. All right. How much heat would be generated? Let's go through this calculation. First off, the sample is like this. It is 3 millimeters by 4 millimeters by 10 millimeters long. So we're passing our current all the way through our sample that way. Okay. Therefore, we know that the resistivity is equal to our overall resistance times area divided by length. All right? Or alternatively, our resistance is going to be our resistivity times length divided by area. So let's go ahead and plug that in. That's 16.78 nano ohm meters. So let's go ahead and turn that into ohm meters, right? So that's going to be e to the negative 9 ohm meters. Now we need to multiply this by length. That is going to be 0 0.01 meters. Divide this whole thing by our area. Okay. So when we do this, our units cancel out except for ohms, right? And so we're able to calculate what the resistance of this sample would be. Now, what else do we need to know? We need to know that joule heating is going to be equal to I squared times R times T, right? So we know what the current is. The problem says that it's 15 amps, and we know that it's for 60 seconds. So now all we need to do is just plug all these things together. So the value of this, we're going to drop right into there. This is going to be 15 amps squared times R, the value from above, multiplied by 60 seconds. When I plug all of that in, and we remember this relationship that one ohm is equal to a joule per second per amp squared, then we end up with units of, our final answer is 0 0.188 joules, and since it asked for the value in millijoules, we would say that that's equal to 188 millijoules. So that's not a lot of heat. You passed a really high current. 15 amps is quite a bit of current. You did it for a minute through a sample, you know, with some dimensions, and it didn't generate a lot of heat. So now let's do another example. It says, okay, if the copper was initially at room temperature, what would be its final temperature if we knew the specific heat of our sample and its density? Give your answer in Celsius to the nearest hundredth of degree. All right, we can do this. So we now know the heat that went into it. And from our previous chapter on thermal transport, we know how to relate heat to change in temperature. We use the heat capacity equation, where it says that the specific heat is equal to the heat that goes into a sample divided by the mass of that sample divided by its change in temperature, delta T, right? So let's go ahead and plug in this 188 millijoules. That will be our Q value. That's how much heat is going into it, right? We know the specific heat. So this is equal to 3860 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. So since this is in kilograms, we need to figure out the mass of our sample, not the number of moles. So we can get the mass. We know the dimensions of it, right? We know that it's 3 by 4 by 10 millimeters cubed. So we need to convert that to a volume, right? And then we can use the density to get that to a mass. Pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and do it. So this will be equal to 0 0.188 joules multiplied by, we're going to take our density and we're going to multiply it by our volume. That will give us a mass and then we'll be able to figure out our delta T, right? So when I do that, uh, let's go ahead and plug in some of these numbers. I find that our volume is equal to 0 0.12 centimeters cubed. Remember, you need to convert from millimeters to centimeters there. So we get 0 0.12 centimeters cubed. We know what the density is. The density is 8.933 grams per centimeter cubed. So there's our expression. We've plugged in uh, density multiplied by volume, and now we have a mass of our copper that was present. We need to convert that to kilograms, and then we can solve for our delta T. So when I plug all that in, I find that delta T is equal to 0 0.045 degrees Kelvin. So if we started at 25 degrees, our temperature initial was 25 degrees. That means that our temperature final is going to be 25 basically 0 0.045 or 25.05 if we round it so it did not heat up basically at all this sample did not heat and this is the reason why they use copper when they uh, put wiring in your homes 
by using copper, something that's very conductive, even though we pass a relatively large amount of current through the wires in our home, they don't heat up even if we use them continuously. They're able to dissipate that heat and they don't uh, pose risk of fire. There was a problem in the past, uh, in the olden days, when they'd build homes where they'd use other materials, things like aluminum, for example, um, which are conductive but maybe not enough. Right, and so they heat up and that can be a problem. So we can do the exact same calculation. Everything's the exact same except it's going to be silver this time. If it's silver, what do we need to take into account? Well, for one thing, the specific heat will be different, the density will be different, and the resistivity will be different. When you plug all those things in, I get the, basically the same final answer, that our temperature final is 25.061 degrees Celsius. So silver would also work, it's just far more expensive, right? Um, interestingly, even though uh, silver is a little bit more conductive, right, its resistivity is 15.87, copper was only 16.78, right? So silver is a little bit more conductive than copper, but you don't see any real improvement because you also have to take into account its heat capacity and its density. And so basically you get the same change in heat. However, if you do this with nichrome, you're going to see a big difference. Nichrome is a material that's designed to be very resistive. Nichrome, if you look at its resistivity, it's 100 e to the negative 8 ohm meters, right? So that is quite a bit more, right? So if we compare this to silver, silver was 15.87 e to the negative 9, or in other words, it was 1.587 e to the negative 8, right? Ohm meters. Now compare that to nichrome. This thing is 1 e to the negative 6 ohm meters, right? Because it was 100 e to the negative 8, so 1 e to the negative 6 ohm meters. So this thing is way, way um, more resistive, and therefore it's going to generate much more heat. So on your grandma's you know, stove, or if you have an old electric stove or something, these sort of materials are often intentionally made of alloys that have a high resistivity so that you maximize your R value and you're able to generate lots of heat even at a low electrical current. Okay, so that's true heating.